Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. And in verse 1, the Bible shows us that we should see ourselves as a servant to Jesus Christ and to others. If you look at Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul calls himself a servant again. And Jude calls himself a servant at the beginning of his epistle. And James does the same thing in James 1.1. 1, 1. So don't be out for yourself, but rather a servant to Jesus Christ and to other Christians. When you help other Christians, you are helping the Lord Jesus Christ. Similar to how when a man helps God's people in the time of Jacob's trouble, they are helping Jesus Christ, as it talks about in Matthew 25, 35 through 40. And the Bible also says we are bought by a price in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. And in Acts 20, 28, it says Jesus Christ purchased us with his own blood. So we belong to Jesus Christ. That means we should serve him. We don't do this to stay saved, but because we love Jesus Christ and appreciate what he did for us. And in verse 1, you also see where Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. So we see we should see all Christians as fellow saints. Notice Paul said to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Paul knew there were other Christians in the body of Christ besides himself. He didn't see himself as a better saint than anybody else. And in Ephesians 3.8, he even said he was less than the least of all saints. In Christ, no saint is better than any other saint. Some may serve Jesus Christ with more effort, but doctrinally, every saint is as sinless as Jesus Christ. The moment you are born again, you become a saint of God. You don't wait until after you're dead and people vote you in as a saint. You became a saint the moment you believe the gospel. And there's nothing you can do to make God like you anymore or love you any more than he already does. All saints are loved equally by God. And another thing we can see in verse 1 is that we should recognize there are other Christians beside yourself. As I said, Paul knew there were other Christians. He wasn't the only one around. Many times when listening... To a Bible teacher, you get the feeling that he believes he is the only saint in the entire world. But Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus in verse 1. And in Romans 16, 7, he said there were people in Christ before him. So Paul wasn't a hyper dispensationalist. Paul didn't believe the body started with Paul. Many times, moderate dispensationalists like Peter Ruckman and Sam Gipp, are slandered by many well-meaning, sincere, non-dispensational teachers. And they say that Ruckman is a hyper-dispensationalist. Even though hyper-dispensationalists believe the body started with Paul, and that the only books which have doctrine for the body of Christ are Romans through Philemon. But moderate dispensationalists do not teach this. Paul knew that there were saints in Christ before he was in Christ. And that he was the only... He wasn't the only godly man alive. He believed there were other saints besides himself. Even though the mystery of the body was revealed to Paul, there were people in the body before Paul. And many modern day teachers think that they're the only ones that are saved there and their little crew and the people that believe just like them. But Paul didn't believe that. But on the subject of being in Christ, every born again believer is in Christ. Every born again believer makes up the body of Christ, which is the church. There are many local churches, meaning assemblies of saved people. But there is only one body of Christ, and it is made up of every saved person. Ephesians 5.32 says the church is a mystery, 
And that mystery was revealed to Paul, and he revealed it to us. But when we were born again, we were baptized into Jesus Christ. And this is a spirit baptism that has absolutely nothing to do with water. And if you look in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, it talks about this. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 12.13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And the Church of Christ will twist these verses and make you think that the baptism is referring to water. But this is referring to a spirit baptism their problem is every time they see the word baptism they think water and every time they see water they think baptism but there's more than one baptism in the bible and what these verses teach is that when a man is born again he is put in christ put in the body of christ some preachers are going around saying that the church only refers to a local congregation of believers but when the Bible talks about the church, it is either referring to a local assembly of believers or the church, which is the body of Christ made up of all born-again believers. And next we realize there is more than one pastor, deacon, elder, and overseer in the body of Christ. Philippians 1.1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So you see that Paul knew there was more pastors or deacons, elders, overseers, and that he wasn't just the man by himself. Many Christians seem to think that there is only one man they can follow, and that if any man disagrees with that man on any level, then the man who disagrees should be referred to as a heretic or a false prophet or a false teacher. But Paul even realized there was more than one overseer in the body of Christ. And some men will blindly follow their chosen man and write off all the other men out there. And they are like the Corinthians. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, it says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas... There is among you envying and strife. Notice those two key words, envying and strife. And divisions are you not carnal and walk as men. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And even now you have carnal Christians who say, Well, I only listen to Peter Ruckman, or I only listen to Stephen Anderson, or I will only listen to James Knox, or read J. Vernon McGee, or I only listen to Jason Cooley, or Charles Lawson, or Robert Breaker, or Brian Denlinger. And then you have guys who don't get into the meat or doctrine of the Bible, who will only listen to stuff like C.T. Townsend, and Larry Brown, and Joe Arthur, and Kenny Baldwin, and which those preachers are great too, and I listen to them, but you have so many different camps of Bible believers, and many of them, not all of them, seem to be against each other. And I have learned things from all the men mentioned above, but I don't have to agree with everything every man says. There is no doubt that all of these men have some false doctrine that they teach. Every teacher or preacher has false doctrine they teach. Some more so than others, like some teach replacement theology and a pre-wrath rapture. But no one in the world is right on every single thing. And if they were, then they would be God. The only person that's right on everything is God. The only person that knows the whole Bible correctly is God. I would be foolish to say that I have never said anything that was false doctrine. I probably believe false doctrine now, right now, even though I'm doing it ignorantly. Every teacher should admit he is bound to be wrong somewhere. You're not right on everything. And when it comes to things like salvation and eternal security, 
we can say we are 100% right on those things because the Bible plainly says it. But many things we may not know until we are with Jesus Christ. And we can't just say these men aren't saved because they teach a doctrine of a devil. And I believe some of the people that I mentioned do teach doctrines of a devil. But isn't all false doctrine from a devil or an unclean spirit? If they have believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ found in 1 Corinthians 15, then they are saved no matter what they're teaching. Even if they have been taught wrong and teaching wrong, what you teach doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. If you have believed the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, put your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, then you're saved. If you've been taught wrong and then you're teaching what you've been taught, then that doesn't affect that you actually got saved to begin with. And Paul had disagreements with other preachers and Christians like Peter. He didn't write off Peter completely, even though Peter was hindering the gospel in Galatians 2. And Peter didn't write off Paul. He even calls him a beloved brother in his epistle. And Paul had some disagreements with Mark, but forgave him and even said, He is profitable unto me for the ministry. Paul definitely did name names when he needed to name names, but some men take it to an extreme to where every time they open their mouth, they name another preacher's name in a very negative way to hurt their ministry. And But next we see in verse 2, we should want the best for other Christians. In Philippians 1-2, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So straight from God... And from the Lord Jesus Christ, you see grace and peace. And Paul wanted that for the Philippians. And that's what he wrote. And notice the dual authorship from the verse. Paul is the author, but it says grace and peace from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Showing the scriptures are inspired by God and God used men to write down what, did he, want, what he wanted them to write. Also notice Paul is wanting grace and peace from God for the Philippians. He wants them to have the daily peace that comes from a daily growth of grace. These things are received through Bible reading and prayer. Paul wasn't wanting war and wrath from God to the Philippians, not even the ones he disagreed with. And next we see that we shouldn't be a lover of our own self. And that is one of the last day signs that Paul warned Timothy about in the epistle to Timothy. Philippians 1.3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. Paul was having other Christians in mind and in his prayers. He wasn't thinking about himself all day long. And I doubt he was attaching selfies to all of his epistles. We should have remembrance of other Christians. If you can't remember, then write down their names and the prayer requests. But ha but thank God upon every remembrance of other Christians. And thanking God goes along with your prayer life. So thanking God, remembering other Christians, and praying daily is something that Paul practiced. Notice Paul is making requests with joy. Even in his situation of being in prison, he is having joy in the Lord and thinking about other people. He wasn't sitting there dwelling about his own problems. Unlike Elijah's situation when he requested for God to take his life. In 1 Kings 19.4 it says he requested for himself that he might die. True joy comes when you get your mind off your problems and start thinking about other people. And that is how Paul made requests with joy even though he was imprisoned. Uh, the next thing we see is try to keep your fellowship with other Christians. Many times today you see Christians breaking fellowship over every little thing. You should not try to cut off other Christians over minor things. And notice what Paul says in verse 5. It says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul has fellowship with these same people from the first day that he started preaching the gospel. He wasn't breaking fellowship constantly. And this is something that you learn more and more over time in your Christian life is don't get so 
worked up or upset about people who disagree with you. And the next thing we see is be confident in the salvation of others. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Many times all you have for evidence of salvation is someone's testimony. If someone isn't living up to a certain standard, yet they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who am I to say they aren't saved? If someone is teaching something I don't believe, yet they say they have put their trust in the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, who am I to doubt their salvation? Sure, it is hard to believe someone is saved many times because of the things they are doing in the flesh, but you can't judge someone's salvation by outward evidence. Your spirit gets born again at salvation, but not your flesh. You still have the same sinful flesh after you get saved, and that is why Christians can still sin and do horrible things. You can keep raising the standard higher and higher, and that is why you can't base someone's salvation off your own standards. You have to go by what the Bible says about being saved. And I've never seen a time where so many people are going around saying, He's not saved. He's not saved. He can't be saved because he does this, or he can't be saved because he believes this. And you see so many preachers, their messages are all about how, oh, I don't believe this guy's saved. And even the title will be, I don't believe he's saved. And it is really messed up to hear preachers doubt other preachers' salvation over things like a pre-trib rapture versus post-trib pre-wrath rapture or flat earth versus globe earth or praying at salvation versus not praying at salvation. They'll argue back and forth at these things. And then they'll end up believing that that person isn't saved because they aren't agreeing with them. But a man is saved by believing. The salvation comes when he believes the gospel in his heart. But most men say with, with their mouth what they are thinking on the inside. For instance, when I got saved, I was believing in my, my heart to salvation. I believed the gospel. But I was saying things with my mouth. That was out, outward evidence of what was taking place inside. So just because you say a prayer when you get saved or after you've already gotten saved, that's just outward evidence of what took place inside. And this, a sinner's prayer, it doesn't save anybody. But when you get, when you get saved and you say a sinner's prayer, you've most likely already believed in your heart to salvation before you even said the prayer. But people are going back and forth about things like that, and it's making them doubt each other's salvation. And men get in fights about things like this to the point of just breaking fellowship and hating each other. And I don't even doubt the replacement theology guys. I don't doubt their salvation because their testimony is they believe the gospel. They say they have believed the gospel. I don't agree with replacement theology. I think that's a doctrine of a devil. But how am I supposed to know if they didn't truly believe the gospel? You can believe the gospel to salvation and then be taught wrong by your pastor. Your pastor can teach you wrong. And if you're trusting what he says and not letting it completely line up with the Bible then you can be deceived and be saved at the same time. But Philippians 1, six says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was confident in their salvation and confident that God would finish what he started. Finish what he started in them until the day of Jesus Christ. And I believe the day of Jesus Christ refers to the judgment seat of Christ. And one of the reasons I believe that is from looking at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And in the doctrinal sense, we are already without offense. The blood of Jesus Christ has already taken away our offenses and we are seen without offense presently right now. Romans 4.25 says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. 
and that's talking about Jesus Christ. But in the practical sense, we need to live a daily Christian life without offense to God. Even though our spirit is sinless and born again, our flesh isn't sinless or born again. We need to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. A good reason for you to be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ is because at the judgment seat of Christ, as I said, we get rewards or a loss of rewards for things done in our body. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So your spirit is born again and sinless presently. In the doctrinal sense, you are without offense. But in another sense, your flesh isn't born again and still sins. We are walking around in this dead corpse that we call a body. We need to live our life without offense to God. Our bodies won't be completely without offense until we get a glorified body at the rapture. While in these glorified bodies, we will receive a reward or loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's over things that we did in our mortal bodies. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. And this is one of the reasons I believe the day of Christ is referring to the judgment seat of Christ. While the day of the Lord in the Bible mainly is referring to the second advent millennial reign. And the way Paul treated other Christians and his converts led many of them to still be there and in fellowship with him even during his imprisonment in hard times. Philippians 1 7 says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Ye all are partakers of my grace. So they stuck with him, defending and confirming the gospel that he revealed to us. And Paul goes, Paul goes on to explain how he feels for them and what he wants for them in their Christian lives.